Oh, good grief. What does the parable of the dishonest manager mean? Hopefully we'll find out in Luke 16. Okay, now we're going to tackle the hardest parable to understand. It confuses everyone. Had to say, I've read it a dozen times just to make sure I had it right before I could say the words to you. Luke 16 starts out with the parable of the dishonest manager. That's what ESV calls it again. That's not in the Bible. That's the summation of it. He tells a story to his disciples and says, there's a rich guy, he has a manager, and the manager had been wasting his possessions. So he called him in and says, what's this I hear about you? Turn in all the accounts, like give me your ledgers of all your management, and you can't be my manager anymore. So the manager thought, hmm, how am I going to fund my life if I don't have this job? I'm not strong enough to dig. I, I don't, can't do anything. I'm not, I don't want to bag. So then he thinks up of a new plan. So he goes to all the people who owe the master money one by one. He says, how much do you owe my master? I have a hundred measures of oil. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, give me 50 and we'll call it over with. Goes to the next one, hundred measures of wheat. Okay, give me 80 and then we'll call this whole thing done. He settles all these debts. Now, you think any person's going to be mad, right? You're going to be mad at the fact that this manager took all the money he was owed and settled it for less and was planning on keeping the money. Unexpectedly, the master praised him for being shrewd. And then Jesus says, the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their generation than the sons of light. So the people who are invested in the world, money and all the things, they're shrewd. They think about these things. But the sons of light, the people following God, are not very shrewd. And he says, you know what? Make friends for yourself by unrighteous wealth. So when it fails, they may receive you in eternal dwellings. Wow. So then goes on to say, those who are faithful in little is also faithful in much. Those who are dishonest with very little will be dishonest with very much. So if you've not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who's going to trust you with the true riches? And if you're not faithful in other people's money, how are you going to be faithful with your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either will hate one or love the other. They'll love money or you'll love God. You can't serve two masters. This is always bringing back that it's not about having money. It's about serving money. And having money often lures us in to start serving it. So it's a warning to us. Whew. Like I said, read it a dozen times and then I just read it for you and then I panicked because it is hard to understand. What Jesus is saying is not anything to do with wanting us to be dishonest. Remember and keep this part in mind that when we're talking about debts, when Jesus is talking, he's talking about sins. He, the debt to God is the sins of the people who are collecting it. And when Jesus goes to the cross, he is forgiving our debts, as it says in the Lord's Prayer. He's forgiving our sins. He is commending people that say, you know, there are worldly people who are shrewd. They plan, they scheme, they think of things. They're trying to figure out how to make things work. But we as the sons of light haven't really done that. We don't go to big measures to try to bring people back to God. Not dishonest measures. The man relieved the debt of the owers. He was removing payment to the master. He wasn't ripping off the individual owers. We're not asking for that. But making big moves to bring people into God's kingdom. We're very meek in what we do. And not very shrewd, being thoughtful, planning, thinking about it. So this is much like the talents, the, the man who had one talent of money, five talents of money, and 10 talents of money. The one who invested it and doubled his income was the good servant. It, it, it ends in the same way of Jesus talking about that. Same thing. Those who have been given little will be trusted with a lot if you've done something with it. In this case, the man was running the books and not really doing anything with the management of the business or whatever this master was doing. Talked about oil, and talked about wheat. You're just sitting there running the books. You're not doing anything. You're not thinking outside the box. You're not investing in people. You're not reaching out to people. But once you start actually going out, 
meeting with people and figuring out a way to bring them in, in this case, settling the debts, that was shrewd. That you're thinking outside the box. You're going out and investing and bringing in more. What Jesus is commending is achieving goals, achieving a good. The people of the world achieve their goals, whether they're bad goals, right? But the people in the light are not achieving their goals. They're not going and getting that harvest, right? They're not bringing investment back in people because they're not very shrewd about it. So in this particular case, when the man was kind of at ends, I don't know what else I'm going to do. I can't do anything else. He figured out a way to plan for his future using his wits. Someone else points out in the commentaries that when you have a loan like this, by undercutting the debt charge, you're actually doing what Moses asked to do. Moses' law said that there should be a reduction of interest charge, releasing of the debts. And so by doing what he just did, he probably also was following the laws of Moses. Okay, cool. So we know that Jesus wants our debts paid, and he's going to pay all of our debts. But are we going out and bringing the message of the clear debts to the debtors, to the owers? That's, I guess, in the end what I thought about. We're reducing the debt, or we should be reducing the debt instead of increasing people's debts as Jesus is going out to pay them. That's what this manager did. He went out and removed people's debts that the master was going to remove anyway because of the law of Moses. But going on to say that if you're good with little things, you'll be trusted with larger things. But what's also true is if we're no good with earthly things, what are we going to do to treat the heavenly riches? Everything is a gift from God, whether it's earthly, whether it's wealth, whether it's whatever our gifts are. And when we're responsible with those, we can be trusted to be responsible for the riches of heaven also. It always felt to me, I guess, when I became a Christian, should we no longer care about the things of the world anymore because now our focus is on heaven? Do we care about our budgets? Do we care about our homes or anything like that? And I think in this case, it's saying that these are gifts. It's all gifts. And we should treat everything well because when we're trusted with the earthly things, we are also showing responsibility for the heavenly things. In the end, everything is from God. And so I guess it makes everything kind of heavenly, right? Even if it's a wealth, even if there are people who don't believe in God and are doing shrewd things or wise things with money, earning more money, building up more money, it's still a gift from God, any way it goes. So I think. Are we using our wealth, our gifts, the things that we were given to bring people to the church? Maybe I use my house and my wealth to invite people who never heard the gospel or would hear the gospel again by using the things I have. It's called the dishonest manager, but in a sense, everyone walked away from it happy and benefited from what just happened. And in the end, Jesus may just be trying to challenge us to be smarter about things. I think in faith, we can get a little pastoral. It's okay. Nothing really matters. Everything is going to wash out in the end. There's no urgency. There's no need to do X, Y, and Z because life will pan out. And I think Jesus is commending and saying, people in this world are working very hard to get their goals, are working very hard to achieve whatever it is they're going to achieve. But we as children of light, trying to attract God to us, what are we doing? How hard are we working? How are we trying to think outside the box in order to get these things done? I think in the end, that is how I boiled it all up, is the fact that God is asking us to think more, try more, plan out more, not to be dishonest or do anything dishonest, but instead try to figure out what it is that we can do, again, to find the lost sheep, to do more. This comes right after the lost sheep. So what can we do more? How can we invest more to get God's goals 
of bringing everyone back better, more smartly, maybe, and that Jesus is encouraging us to use our resources, to use the resources of God more wisely with the effect of bringing more people back, bringing back more lost coins, more lost sheep, more lost sons, and using the wealth of the world to further the ministry of God. The other part, I think, when I was thinking about this as well, is God talks to us about the riches of heaven, that we don't worry or we don't invest in the things that will go away. We've heard that in another money passage, that things that will rot or things that will spoil or money that will turn to dust. When we invest in the worldly things, they disappear, they evaporate, but instead we should invest in the things that are eternal, which means bringing people to God, bringing back the lost sheep, bringing the people and helping the people of the kingdom of God be a community together. When we invest in the heavenly treasures, we are investing for all eternity. But when we invest in the wrong things, they disappear. We're supposed to take our worldly wealth that are gifts from God and invest them in ways that will matter in the long term of heaven. And you think about it, that when we go to heaven, we don't go with anything. We don't go with our clothes and our cars and our house and our books or anything like that. But what we will go with are the other people we brought with us. That's the investment that matters the most. Then the Pharisees, because they loved money, heard all these things and they ridiculed him. Jesus, of course, knows the heart, knew what they were saying. And he says, you know, you justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. Jesus knows their heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination to the sight of God. We think of all the things that we exalt, power, gorgeous looks, being admired for your stature in life. Those are the things that man looks after. What God cares about is entirely different. He knows our heart, and God knows how we are ranking in the God meter as compared to the meter of men. The law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist. And then the good news of the kingdom, the gospel, the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. We heard this in Matthew where it was every drib and drab or every iota, every piece is going to be maintained in the scriptures. But the law and the prophets are now passed with John, John being the last Old Testament prophet, and the good news of the kingdom, Jesus is here. So all you that are saving up those things of earth, all, think of all the things that we idolize, that we think greatly of, that we look to stars or we look to famous people and we say, oh, aren't they living the greatest life? They're not. God is saying there's a whole other kingdom here. The kingdom of God is what matters the most. And so I think he here is calling them unfaithful because they are looking to the things of this earth. They're looking at the things that matter to earthly people and not at the things that matter to God truly. In the end, God created all the treasures of earth owns the treasures of earth, and they stay here when we go on. This is not something that is a heavenly topic. Someone commented that God gives us tests by giving us money, by giving us things on earth, so he knows how trustworthy we are in the New Jerusalem for it. That our investment in it, I I know Rick Warren talks a lot about that, that we treasure up things of heaven by investing in things that are eternal. And this is a test in the end of whether or not we can take the earthly things and use them for God's service. Or are we going to use the earthly things to make more earthly things and to be like the Pharisees who are just trying to justify and look great in front of other people? This is where he talks again about the divorce. His wife and marries another commits adultery. He who marries a woman divorced also commits adultery because this is what was going on with the Pharisees. This comes from the law of Moses. 
And Jesus is saying it not so much to repeat the law of Moses, but to point out that these Pharisees who are trying to look good before men and not God are divorcing their wives, are having debates about whether they can divorce their wives because maybe she isn't as attractive as she used to be. Maybe she's not the best housekeeper or the best cook, or maybe she annoys them this way or that way. And Jesus is telling them, quit being hypocrites. Now, because we already had one very complicated parable, we have another one. And this one was kind of funny. I remember this from when I was a little kid, because I think there was that movie Godspell that had this parable in that movie, which was not a godly movie, but it was trying to illustrate some of the parables of the Bible. So there was a rich man, and he was clothed in purple and fine linen. He ate all the food all the days. And at his gate was a poor man named Lazarus, a different Lazarus, who was covered in sores. And he just wanted to be fed. He wanted any kind of scrap he could get from the rich man's table. But instead, dogs were coming and licking his sores. I mean, this guy was basically just in the dump. You know, he was treated like garbage. So the poor man dies and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. Then the rich man also has died, was buried because he's rich. So he has a fancy schmancy burial. But he ends up in Hades, in torment. And so he looks up and he sees Abraham way off. And Lazarus, this man he saw at his gate who was practically garbage, right by his side. And he calls out, Father Abraham, mercy on me. Send send Lazarus to me to dip his end of his finger in water so it cools my tongue and anguishes the flames. This is funny because think about this. So this guy is in Hades. Lazarus is in heaven. And he still looks at that poor man a little bit like his servant. Send him to me and have him ease my pain. Isn't that funny? He like can't order Abraham around because Abraham's kind of a big dude. But that guy, I still can order him around. Then Abraham said, you had good things in your lifetime. That, you know, that's, that was your reward. But Lazarus had everything bad. And now he's comforted and you're in anguish. Beyond all this, there's a chasm between us, which is, it says fixed, but doesn't mean fixed as in repaired, but means a distance apart from each other. And so we can't send people back and forth. And so there's no crossing back and forth. So I can't do that anyway. But then he wants to order Lazarus again. I mean, Lazarus had this really horrible life. He's finally sitting there with Abraham in comfort and peace and eternal joy. And this rich guy is ordering him, first bring me water. Now go talk to my family. So he begs him, say, you know, send this to my father's house. I have five brothers. Warn them what will happen if they follow my path. You know, they'll be in a place of torment. And Abraham's like, you know what? They have Moses, meaning the Torah, the prophets, the rest of the books of the Bible, which the Sanhedrin didn't believe in. So Jesus is clearly calling out. He believes in both. They can hear it. They they can repent from that. They have everything they need in order to follow God. And then the rich man comes back and says, no, that's not true. Unless someone tells them. They won't repent. If you will send someone, they will. Abraham's like, if they don't hear it from the law and the prophets, the Torah and and the prophets, no one is going to be convinced. Boy, this is going to be the episode of the tough parables. The interesting thing is that I always learned as a general rule that you can tell a parable is a parable that Jesus tells because there's no named people in the parable, not like Moses and Abraham, but meaning the man Lazarus. Why does he have a name? Named stories are true stories. So why does Lazarus have a name if this is a parable? Is this not a parable? We don't know. And we could never tell whether or not people can talk back and forth. We don't know the size of the chasm between the two places. So This parable, also very puzzling. I think, again, that this parable is less about money in that same sense. Rich people can go to heaven, although Jesus says it's harder for a rich man to go to heaven. 
because I think you rely on your money instead of God. The poor can also maybe not go to heaven because they don't believe in Jesus or they reject his gift. Why this is pointed out in this kind of way and why Jesus brings in these parables of the rich people is one, he doesn't want us to love money, serve two masters. The other part is, is did that man who clearly knew who Lazarus was, right? He knew who that guy was. He recognized him sitting next to Abraham. So he saw that guy sitting outside his gate, having the dogs lick his wounds, having no food to eat. Did he ever lift one finger to help that guy? He saw him. We know he saw him. And now he wants to order him around. But the question is, is he ignoring the people who need compassion, people who need mercy? Jesus has told us in other places that we should be giving mercy and compassion to other people. And yet this rich man completely ignored him until he wanted this Lazarus guy to do things for him. Now he recognizes him because he wants two favors granted. But even Abraham is saying, nope. First of all, it's not possible. Big chasm between us. Secondly, it wouldn't help. That's the part that always got me, you know, too, about this is that what if God had come back in this way or done work in this other way, showed up in the clouds, talked to everybody individually? And what is actually being said here is you have everything you need to follow God in the law and the prophets because it talks about what God wants from us, how we fall short of that, and what the pathway is for God to rescue us in the promise of a Messiah. Everything's there. And if they can't gather the message of God from it, nothing's going to show them, even a man coming back from the dead, which is. Jesus is about to do. But even when the man, the rich man himself, doesn't think of himself, but thinks of his family, he still wants Lazarus to come out of comfort and his reward and to go save that rich man's family. They're not going to listen. They're not going to pay attention. And Abraham says they have everything they need to do so. And so I think, again, this ties into the first thing money, rewards on earth are meant to be used for ministry, for caring and having compassion for other people. And we're accountable for the money and the things we do on earth with our earthly gifts. Some of the commentaries like to point out that the term Hades is not really what we consider hell. It's a Greek word borrowed from a Hebrew word that means Gehenna. And Gehenna is the dump. It's where you throw out the trash. Literally, that man who was poor and living at the gate was trash. And now the rich man is in the trash. There's a gate outside of Jerusalem, which is called the Dung Gate, which is where all the trash went. That's Gehenna. This is the term that we're using. So, this is Hades, is the Greek word for Gehenna. Some people feel like that is a waiting place, as it says in Revelation, which I can't wait till we get to that for the people who are waiting their final judgment. Someone else points out the interesting fact is that can people in Hades see people in heaven? And the fact that the man who was in Hades remembers people, remembers his family. So it's not like our memories are wiped out at all. And that this is pointing towards the time we mentioned that it said that even if a man comes back from the dead, obviously Jesus is about to die and come back from the dead. And I think this is where Jesus is saying, even when it happens, even when I come back from the dead, there will be people out there who still don't believe me. He is forecasting that this will not be a message to everybody and some people will ignore it to their peril. But the last point that I think is interesting about this entire parable is pointing out that the law of Moses and the prophets are enough for us to understand, learn about Jesus, and understand the Messiah, believe in him, and have eternal life. That part is enough and was fulfilled by John, the last Old Testament prophet. And that ends chapter 16. Boy, that was a rough one, right? The parables were a lot. My meditation this week is, 
oh my goodness, what am I not going to meditate about? But honestly, how I use my worldly gifts that God gave to me in the purposes of the kingdom, that, that's going to require some thought. And my prayer is that I will be a better steward of the good things that God has given me to use them in the purposes of God's kingdom, looking out for the poor, looking out for each other, and bringing in the harvest of God's lost sheep. What I'm going to share with others is the fact that God cares about people regardless of status, regardless of position, and he cares what we do with the heavenly gifts we've been given, with the earthly gifts we've been given. Everything matters. And when we've done a good job and are trusted with little, we'll be trusted with more. I hope people know that being trustworthy in everything we do is very important. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe. And if you wouldn't mind leaving a review or dropping me an email and letting me know what you think about this podcast. I appreciate you listening and have a wonderful weekend.